you everyone for coming to today's RELS summer. It's very hybrid as you can see, but really great to have people in person. And I would like to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Amethyst Johnson, who's visiting us from her new position as a postdoc at University of Alabama in Huntsville, working with John Chen. And uh, recently she had done her PhD at the University of Leeds in the UK and worked with the UK Met Office and the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, uh, doing work on the science and parameterization of tropical cyclone boundary layers. And previous to that, she was, uh, did her bachelor's at the University of Manchester, working in both Venusian microphysics and tornado climatology work. So a really nice round, rounded area of work. So I'll let you take over from here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So this work, I've, I'm only a month into my postdoc, so this work is really the, the tail end of my PhD. So yeah, I did this work uh, in collaboration with Jeff Kepper at the Bureau of Meteorology. And to be honest, he did it, a huge amount of help for this work. I could not have done that without him. So I'm going to be talking about We've got a case study of a landfall in um, tropical cyclone in Australia, of course, it's Jeff. Um, so just a pre-warning that some of the signs are, are switched. So your flow will go the opposite way around, the, the vorticity, the signs are switched. And I will point that out as we go on because that did confuse people at the HRD when I gave this seminar before. Um, so just, just kind of a highlight. So this was an interesting storm. I was looking for something simple, to be honest, and it, it didn't turn out quite like that. Um, what happened was we were looking for a simple landfalling case. And this tropical cyclone, Veronica, is moving from the north and making landfall down here. Um, so. It, it made landfall, I'll use the cursor here. Um, you can see these kind of two markers here, and these are 24 hours apart. Oh, you can't see that on the screen. These two markers, 24 hours apart. So you've got kind of a landfall, and the storm remains stationary around there, moving less than one meter per second for about 24 hours. So really, the, the storm was on the border of the coast for around a day. So this gave us what we thought was the perfect opportunity to study a landfall and the effects of landfall. Just another note that in this region, it's not very urban. There are a few ports, but nothing major. And then it's, it's all kind of mainly flat terrain. So it seemed like the perfect case. and. On the bottom row, you've got this, um, these are SAR images. So we got four really nice passes of the storm around 12 hours apart as it was approaching land. And I just want to point out in panel D that you kind of develop this weakness in the, the north of the eye wall. It's maybe not too clear to see, but this is kind of what we will be basing the talk on. So we ran um, a full physics model and a boundary layer model. So I'll just start with the full physics. We used the Met Office. I was working in collaboration with the Met Office for this project. And so we used their operational forecasting setup in the regional configuration. So this is 1.5 kilometers and it's nested in the global. And so, these plots here just show four sites. A, B, C, and D are all different sites, um, surface observations. And the red lines there are the model, and the black lines are the observations. So this is basically just to say that the model was a very good match for the observations. We did have slight track deviation, but it only seemed like a deviation because the storm wasn't moving, really. So it was slightly offset. But generally, if you look at the kind of statistics for the National Hurricane Center, it was well within the margins of average error for um, track. 
And then just the kind of support, so these are just wind speed and, and temperature basically, but the horizontal distribution. So you can kind of see the difference now in the track is that the model in panel D and the observations in C. So the model is slightly to east, um, but generally the, the kind of wind distribution, size, intensity is a pretty good match. So we were happy with this. We did run an ensemble, but uh, we just chose to run with ensemble member zero and use it as a deterministic because we did too much analysis basically for the ensemble. So just a note on that, that when we looked at the ensemble, obviously the tracks were all different, intensity was different, but consistently in all of them we had this break in the north of the eye wall and it doesn't matter how far away from land the storm is it doesn't matter how well initialized the storm is anything like that it always had this break in the north of the eye wall and it also had this kind of you can see that the wind is kind of shaped like a comma so this kind of um, trailing feature there seems to correspond to a rain band and this Rain band was also a consistent feature across the ensemble. So these are some interesting things that start popping up. I've got this a very boring slide here <laughs> about the um, boundary layer model. We just used the boundary layer model of Kepa and Wang in 2001, modified by Kepa in 2018. And I'm not going to go into the details because I'm just going to show some very idealized work that we did with this. But essentially, you just input a profile at the, the top of the boundary layer and it kind of figures out the, the structure of the boundary layer from that. So to start off with that, as I say, I, was, I start with some very idealized simulations. We kind of use the, the boundary layer model and the full physics together to figure out what's going on. Because obviously when you're in the full physics model, you can't isolate processes very well. And it was such, it turned out to be such a complex case. There, there's just so much going on. We need to start isolating some processes. So first we look at the landfall because this is why we chose the case, right? So on the left there, I have the tangential wind on the top, radial wind, and then the vertical wind for just a symmetric ranking vortex. And this is just uh, simulated using the boundary layer model. No motion, because we tried to get it similar to the, the real case. So there's no motion in this. There's also no coastline in this one. Then, we add a coastline just to see what the expected effects of that landfall would be. And these essentially just kind of support, if, if you've all seen the Hilwiak and Nolan papers and the, the observational papers that Rob Rogers did um, recently, this kind of just supports that. So what we see is that at 10 meters, obviously the tangential wind speed decreases over land. That's just what you expect. We also get this asymmetry in the inflow that develops. And you get this maximum in the inflow immediately offshore. Again, this is consistent with their papers. And the vertical wind speed kind of increases directly offshore, probably just down to that increased convergence there. Now. If we go up a level, let's go to 300 meters, we kind of see a similar thing. So tangential wind speed is still decreased over land. We've still got this asymmetry in the inflow. And what's interesting now is we develop this um, rain band in the south, which looks quite similar to what we see in the full physics simulations. And this is likely just down to that increased frictional convergence over land. Um, now, how does this compare? Because these are very idealized simulations, right? And in reality, our storm looks nothing like this. So what we did next, um, 
is kind of, I may need to just explain this a little before I go into it. So instead of using the ranking vortex now, we took the, the vorticity field from the full physics model and threw it into the boundary layer model just to see what came out. So now I've got same, same thing. So on the left-hand side, there's no coastline. And on the right-hand side, there is this coastline at a similar angle and distance to what we see in the full physics simulations. And uh, there's a few things to note here, because obviously this isn't a clean case, because we've taken this from the full physics, so you've still got all the signatures there of the landfall that were in the full physics simulation. But this is just to kind of see, is, is more of a sanity check, really, just to test that the, the effect of the coastline is robust. And again, we see a very similar thing. So the tangential wind speed decreases over land. And it, it's a very discrete difference here, but we do get an increase in the inflow immediately offshore. We still have this quite asymmetric inflow that's produced by the input from the full physics model. But you do seem to get some kind of impact from the land. And what's also interesting is that in these, um, so the black contours or the vertical velocity um, marked at 0.5 meters per second. And we kind of coined them as rain bands, although they're probably just bands of convection. And we noticed that there are kind of bands of lower inflow or outflow along these bands. And this is consistent with some of the previous work. So not so much the outflow, but a reduced inflow has been noted in observational studies of landfall in rain bands. And also the Kepert 2018 paper was an idealized study that looked at the wind flow around a rain band and saw something similar. So. The outflow is something new, but in general, we have seen previously that rain bands can modulate the flow. And then again, we do seem to get this increase in the wind speed immediately offshore in the vertical wind. And again, how does the actual storm compare? Because these are still very idealized. And to be honest, these simulations don't look a whole lot like the full physics model. So then if we take a step into the full physics and see what's going on, so these are kind of hard to digest, so I'll need to walk you through this. The top three panels are cross sections at the radius of maximum wind, which was really small, about 15 kilometers. And then in the bottom panels, these are wind um, plan views averaged within the lowest 1.5 kilometers. So still very much boundary layer conditions. And we do see this decrease in the tangential wind um, when it hits the coast. And we also see a very strong signature of the radial wind and correlating that to the vertical wind. So I'll just kind of walk through these features. So this offshore radial flow is not consistent with the idealized work that we saw with Hilwiak and Nolan or the Rogers and Zhang work, and actually from our previous idealized studies that I just showed. So this is um, a strange feature, and we, we did doubt this at first. But it, all the calculations are correct, um, so the data don't lie, as someone said to me one time. <laughs> so these are some other interesting features, uh, is that you've kind of got these maximum in the outflow and an in ten inland tangential wind maximum that kind of correlated with these uh, rain band that we saw earlier. So again, this kind of supports the idea that the rain band is, is modulating some of that flow. Interestingly, we do see an east to west through flow in the radial wind. 
at these low levels, and this extends further than the, the rain band system. So this is also another interesting feature, and it, it seems to suggest that there's something else going on, maybe something more larger scale. And so from these results, I kind of came to the conclusion that this is much more complicated than just a, a landfall. There's so much more going on in the dynamics here. So one big question I got in terms of this eye wall break at the HRD was, could, could ventilation be playing a role? So if you've got this um, thermodynamic de depleted air from the rain band that's being uh, kind of fl transferred in to the inner core, maybe this is what is causing this depletion in the north offshore. So I investigated this. Um, I, was, I was quite furious that I didn't include these kind of plots in my HRD talk. I just had to tell them to trust my word. Um, but clearly, if you look at the theta E in panel A, there's not really a, um, a big depletion in the theta E that correlates with that eye wall break. And of course, it, it's quite logical that you get this decrease in theta E as you go in inland and then coming off because obviously you're losing the surface fluxes there. So this was just, I just put this in to say, hey, it's not the ventilation, it's not cold, dry air getting drawn in from above or radially inward. So there must be something else going on in this case. Now, the rain band has played a big role and you can see it here, it's, it's clear in the the plan views here that the rain band is having an impact on the storm system, although not necessarily this, this break. So we went back down to kind of the ground and, and just see what the conditions are down there and see what's going on. So you see this very strong comma shape in the sea level pressure. This is a very strong band of convection. And you also see these signatures of convergence and divergence there along the band as well. So this told us that this is a significant system that's, that's causing some kind of change to the dynamics. But then if you look at the, the surface temperature, moisture, and altitude, it's really difficult to say, OK, this is, this is causing the, the rain band to be more convective. So, in the surface temperature, the, the rain band, so the rain band's in the black contour, is actually going over colder land. The, the soil moisture content was an interesting one because actually we've seen previously that when MCSs move over strong soil moisture gradients, they can intensify. So this was an interesting thought. However, it seems that the probably the soil moisture gradient was just caused by the precipitation from the tropical cyclone. And there were no strong ridges in the, the surface altitude that would cause this sort of strong uh, upward motion. So it, it goes up to less than 500 kilometers altitude and it's quite shallow. And again, when we looked at the ensemble, this kind of rain band system was there, depend not not dependent on where exactly it was geographically located. So again, this tells us that there's something more large scale going on. So to look at the large scale, I've just keep talking about it but never shown it. Uh, we've got on the left hand side is the relative vorticity. Like I said, we're in the southern hemisphere. So the blue colors, they are cyclonic and the orange, red are anticyclonic. So what we can see is that we seem to have some impact of the monsoon trough providing uh, cyclonic vorticity in the north. And we've got this kind of anticyclone system in the south pushing through. It's kind of pushing through from the west and it moves eastward throughout the simulation. And this seems to be drawing in a lot of anticyclonic vorticity across the, the lower half of the domain. 
So these are just from the global configuration, just to kind of get an idea of what we were nesting from. And then I've, I've put the steering flow on as well, just because, partly because you can see the kind of motion, but also because the storm stalled. And this is just something that you need to think about. It's interesting that we would kind of expect the, the storm to travel westward along the coast, kind of trail along the coast. But you've got this very strong kind of steering flow to the, to the east. So this is probably contributing to the stalling. But I really want to focus on the, the vorticity. It seems strange, right, that you would have weaker wind spin weaker wind speeds where there's more cyclonic vorticity it just seem kind of strange and you can see as well in the anti-cyclonic vorticity near to the storm you seem to have some smaller scale features um, again it's difficult to say if you've got convective features often they produce a cyclonic and anti-cyclonic component it's really difficult to say that convection will cause uh, such a high amount of anticyclonic vorticity there. So if we go, I'll just walk you through this figure. Um, we thought that if we dig deeper into this vorticity and kind of see, because it's the rotational flow really we, we're thinking about. So in panel A is the vorticity from the full physics model. Panel D is the just the flow field from the full physics model. And then we thought that, l let's just calculate the rotational flow from the vorticity and see what we get out. And the divergent flow is, is just the residual of that. So what's interesting is that just from the rotational flow from the vorticity field, we can reproduce this I will break. And you're not reproducing all of the asymmetry there. I think in the divergent flow, you've got the impact of the rain band. And it's quite a clear comma shape, as we see in the, the rain band. So this was kind of heading into the right direction. OK, okay what is causing this eye wall break? It's not the thermodynamics. It's not the land. So next, we decompose the vorticity using a Fourier decomposition. And it's just it's what you'd expect from a Fourier decomposition, really. We have the strong wave number one, and we have these uh, small dipole in the eye of the storm, and then a larger dipole uh, that inverts a larger radii. And then we have uh, wave number two, which contributes to the el ellipticity of the, the eye as well. So we thought if we run with this wave number one and let's just do some idealized experiments with this and see what comes out of it. So I go back now to the idealized model, uh, just use a ranking vortex. And this is the rotational flow and the vorticity associated with this uh, vortex. Just a standard symmetric vortex. Now if we I've created this asymmetric vorticity field in panel B, which mirrors uh, wave number one. You don't have the um, eye wall dipole, um, eye dipole, sorry, but you do have the kind of larger scale. And in panel E is this rotational flow associated with that. And it is just what you expect. You've just got these two spinning gyres and you've got this flow in the center. But what's interesting is that the, the top of the anticyclonic gyre in the south and the bottom of the cyclonic gyre in the north both produce an easterly flow. So it starts to make a bit more sense now if you sum these fields together that you would get this kind of shape. So the anticyclonic gyre, which is uh, negative, which is positive uh, in the red colors, is producing enhancement of the tangential wind just from the kind of the top of the gyre of the rotational flow. 
and the inverse is happening then in the north. So you get this easterly flow that's rejecting the tangential circulation, causing a break. So this, it was an interesting result. Obviously it doesn't quite look what, like what we saw, <laughs> but we do produce a break and we produce a break from a larger scale vorticity gradient. Now, an important thing from this is that the, the vorticity gradient that I idealized was based on the full physics uh, simulation. So I kind of, it was a bit of a messy method to do it. I just removed the eye. So I just removed 50 kilometers square from the center of the storm just to remove that cyclonic, really cyclonic eye. And then I just calculated the ratio between the south and north vorticity. So it's a really crude way to do it, but it kind of just informed this, this gradient. So next, we devised this metric called the I will break magnitude or I will break ratio. So uh, in panel A, I've got an elliptical storm, which is what we saw in the full physics. And this is just to demonstrate that in, in a perfectly symmetrical storm, maybe we would just find the, the difference between the maximum and minimum uh, wind speed along a, a radius. But if it's elliptical, you really can't do that. So what we did was we found the the maximum wind speed uh, basically along every azimuth within 150 kilometers. And then the I will break ratio is the ratio between the, ma the, the minimum value and the mean value. So if you look at a symmetric vortex, it's literally just the, the ratio between the minimum tangential wind speed and the mean along a radius. We just had to adapt it because it's elliptical. So we use this along with the vorticity gradient to kind of determine a question that was coming at me from everyone. <laughs> about, uh, how strong does the gradient need to be? Which is a good question. So I ran some experiments and I used, um, in, in the top left of each sub panel, you can see the vorticity ratio just between the north and south and the I will break ratio, which I just explained. And it is kind of just what you expect. If we go back to those, the previous plots where we calculated the rotational flow from the gradient, it's just a linear correlation, basically, between the, the intensity of the break and the vorticity gradient. And we did do this. I, I, did many of these and plotted it. And we just got, I think the correlation was something like 0 0.995. <laughs> it's just it's just the maths of it. This is very idealized. And I think if you do these experiments in nature, you're not gonna get as, as clean results just because there are so many other processes going on. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to highlight here is that the, the idealized and the full physics, completely different, really. <laughs> the whole idea of this was just to prove that the large scale vorticity environment can produce this kind of impacts on the storm. Uh, so w one important thing to note is that the, the break in the full physics model was of a higher magnitude than the idealized. So it means we had lower, relatively lower wind speeds in that I will break in the north. And this is probably likely due to that, the, the rain band, which was diverting the flow. And just a note on the rain band is that I, I wouldn't call it um, a typical tropical cyclone outflow. It's more convergence into the band. And then when you put that into cylindrical coordinates, centered on the eye, it projects as outflow when it's just really a convergence into a very strong band. So it, 
it has some diversion on the flow, but I think calling it a tropical cyclone outflow is a bit of a overstatement there. So I do think that this rain band contributed to this eye will break. Also, the effects of wind shear. So there was a northwesterly wind shear and it was quite strong during this time. And you do get this break in the up shear quadrants, which is kind of what we expect of a asymmetric distribution due to shear. And this extended band of wind, this comma shape, we've kind of shown this to be associated with that rain band, and this is supported by the literature. Just some comments on the rain band is that we showed that it was enhanced by the land, frictional convergence. It's kind of what you expect. Um, but also the location of it, so it's down shear right, it's in the down shear right quadrant. So this is where we expect the strongest convection to be in shared environments too. So we kind of got this just compounding impacts on the, the storm. So we've got the landfall shear enhancing the rain band, which diverts the flow. And you just end up with this very complicated picture, right? I think if you didn't have the vorticity gradient, I don't think you would get the break, although I think you would get some asymmetry. Um, so this is just something to think about, and I'm going to bring it to here. This is just kind of a reiteration of what I just said. So there's there's so many things to, to think about in this case, um, but I think the main takeaway is that these large-scale gradients can impact the, the boundary layer wind structure of tropical cyclones. Although, I was going to leave it there, but just uh, I think it, an important point, if I go back here, is that if we moved the, the vorticity gradient in panel B upwards or downwards slightly, you would change the result. But it would still have a widespread impact on the vortex structure. So this just acts as a proof of concept that the large-scale vorticity environments can impact the boundary layer wind structure. But really, it's much more complicated than just saying, OK, the, the, the gradient center is in the center of the storm. It's very unlikely to be like that in most cases in nature. Uh, so I think this this will be an interesting case just to look at um, an interesting concept to look at in other storms. I think we've never used this lens before to evaluate um, tropical cyclone wind asymmetry, just in terms of the large scale vorticity. Uh, so I'm just hoping it, if I had the time and if I had unlimited funding, I would continue <laughs> to work on this and just kind of investigate other cases. Um, we did know Hurricane Adelia, um, I think from last year, had a similar structure and did have this vorticity gradient. So that was just recommended to us um, by someone at the HRD after seeing these. It's just, hey, we saw a very symmetric storm, maybe you could look. And it turned out to be that there was a vorticity gradient. So. I think it's just something that we've never looked for before. Uh, it's just a new lens to look at uh, asymmetry. So I'll probably leave it on this slide and I'll be happy to take any questions. You don't have to use a mic because we have a mic'd up system, so you can ask from anywhere. And we also have people online, so please uh, does the storm have to be almost stationary to be able to see this kind of uh, thing? Otherwise, the, the mean flow or relative flow would also do a similar thing, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because motion all, also kind of imposes this wave number one in gradient uh, in the wind speeds. So I think it, it's something that needs to be looked at. I mean, Adelia was a moving case. And we saw this. I think 
It kind of depends on the relative translation speed of the storm, the strength of the vorticity gradient, all of these things come into play because it, in this case, we initially expected the landfall to be the major contributor, but it turned out not to be. So I think it's really dependent on the relative kind of magnitude of these different forces. So the storm was in kind of stationary for over 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, did, was there any impacts of diurnal cycle potentially on the marine dam? Yeah, we looked at that, but this seemed, it didn't seem to be a diurnal cycle. Um, how do you think this picture you're showing here would evolve in time if you say initialized a numerical model with this and just let it go? Yeah, it's interesting because um, when we initialized the, the boundary layer model with the full physics vorticity field, uh, we did see an eye wall break and they, we left it to run for 24 hours. Uh, the eye wall break kind of, it was actually higher up in the boundary layer. So it was maybe 1.6 kilometers, but I think that's just down to the physics of the boundary layer model. Um, but it, it stayed a consistent feature. I think it really depends on how the it, it, large scale evolves. Yes, that's kind of what I was mm -hmm. um, wondering if you thought about. I mean, it, the top middle panel seems to be that the vortex at the top is going to cause the vortex at the bottom to kind of move that way, whereas mm. vice versa, the one on the bottom caused the one on the top to kind of move that way, and there's going to be this big yeah, I'm not sure. Evolution over time. Because this is very idealized, obviously. Right. If I go back to this, um, this was, um, this is more what we see in nature. Is you've just got these kind of opposing processes that are going on. So they kind of they'll move in their own way. Um, yeah, monsoon trough and these. It's really difficult to pin down actually what was causing so much anticyclonic vorticity in the south, but there was a strong uh, high pressure system down there. But I think it, in terms of the idealized simulations, that I'm not sure how that would work. Because, yeah, like you say, I think they would kind of push each other. But in nature, it's, it's much more. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, let's thank Amethyst again for the presentation.